Thanks very much indeed. Good morning, everyone. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be here, and uh, thank you very much for the uh, very kind introduction. I've been following the conference um, avidly on Twitter, actually, over the last day or so. Um, uh, pe have picked up a couple of new followers. In fact, uh, a slot is currently available to be my 7,000th follower. Uh, <laughs> just, just showing off. Um, and uh, it was one of, the, one of my ob observations as I was, um, as I was thinking about what uh, contribution I could usefully make to this conversation that you're having uh, with each other and indeed with lots of people outside of this room through, through the extraordinary medium of social media, um, is to try to think about what, 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 are the, what are the key elements of this debate and what are we bringing, uh, we are minds trying to bring, bring to this conversation uh, and to this discussion. And I'm, I've really st I'm going to start off by making uh, an assumption, and um, I hope this is a reasonable assumption. You've been here for a day. Um, you, you, you've come to a conference uh, that is launching the Restraint Reduction Network. I'm going to make a, a wild guess that you're probably quite interested in reducing restraint. Um, and I'm going to assume that you're not going to the conference down the road called um, Increasing Restraint. Um, and I don't imagine any conference has ever been put on called how to increase the amount of restraint that goes on in, a, in, in, a, in wards or in, in, indeed in other settings. So um, I'm working on the assumption that on the whole, most of the people in this room um, are at least a reasonable way along that, that line that believes that we could reduce the amount of restraint that we currently have in our environment. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm making that assumption. If, if that's not the case, uh, um, do challenge me when we have get to questions. Um, secondly, uh, if that wasn't the case, I think uh, what we've just heard from Joy uh, will almost certainly, I hope, um, have uh, fully persuaded you of the reason why this is an important issue. But I'm also, what I also want to do in this session is to, is to imp widen the context of the conversation. And I want to widen the context of the conversation in three particular ways. I want to talk a little bit about the wider context of crisis care, of acute and crisis care as it currently sits at the moment, and not just some of the, uh, uh, some of the very positive things that are happening, but also some of the real challenges that anybody who works in uh, inpatient care or acute and crisis care face. I want to talk a little bit about the concept of therapeutic optimism, um, and I want to do that because I think it, uh, partly because I hope it, I think it'll be a bridge into some of the, uh, into what you'll hear from Len, uh, but also because I think uh, the concept of therapeutic optimism is a very important way of um, winning the argument um, that I know many of you are going to go back from this conference and, and have to make in uh, the environments in which you're working. And thirdly, and of course you'd expect me to do this, uh, I want to talk a bit about the, not just the importance and significance of listening to people with lived experience of mental health problems and mental illness in this context, but also to point to um, some examples of how this co-production approach that you've already heard about um, is an incredibly powerful way to win uh, that argument and to deliver change in an effective and positive way. Um, so. Uh, so, so, so I suppose what I'm hoping to do in this session in total is to give you the arguments, more arguments, you've probably already got many arguments, but more arguments still for, um, for uh, going back to your settings, your environments, and helping uh, achieve this change. And, and I'd kind of start off by just reminding people, I suppose, and I'm sure you're very familiar with our, the, a lot of the work that we do at MIND, um, uh, in terms of both our long-term heritage as an organisation that um, stands up for the rights of people with mental health problems in all kinds of different environments and different settings, um, uh, uh, but also an organisation that um, helps and supports people through our local mine network, 150 local mines up and down the country, supporting last year uh, 400,000 people. Um, uh, an increase of 100,000 on, on the year before, which tells us quite a lot in itself about, um, I think, the very real challenges that mental health services are currently facing in the current environment, the, the economic environment, an environment that is seeing significant change in terms of the whole restructuring new systems inside the NHS, um, and, um, and also... 
is, is an environment that is working increasingly in a very different way. It's an environment that recognises that hospital stays are short-term, not long-term, that our objectives are, um, are to provide um, the best possible outcomes for people with mental health problems, and that those objectives are not just about their clinical uh, improvement, if you like, but about helping and supporting people to realise their own ambitions, uh, to be able to, to, to play their role in uh, an equal role in our society. And in the work we do, we, we are driven by, completely driven by, what people with mental health problems tell us. And they tell us in a whole variety of different ways. Increasingly, they tell us very directly on, on Twitter about what their, their views are. They tell us through that network of local minds. They tell us through our network of 20,000 campaigners um, about what it is that they see as being important and what people want us to act on. But also, crucially and importantly, how, and more and more, um, how we can support people to act on issues for themselves. Um, and so this kind of journey that we're on as an organisation is very much about not just simply listening to people with lived experience, but uh, to uh, putting people's experiences right at the heart of what we do and supporting and enabling people to deliver uh, change for themselves um, on the ground at a local level. And so into this context, into this work that we do, our approach um, uh, came, uh, uh, has come the question of acute and crisis care. Now, you know, you've know, you already heard from Joyce a lot about um, a number of kind of drivers, I suppose, that have been around. And I'm not going to spend long talking about this because I suspect you've heard it in all you probably you'll probably I suppose the only the only issue might well be that you'll have heard by the end of this conference four or five different versions of this story um, uh, and um, uh, it's not quite it was the sun what done it uh, kind of question but uh, but I suppose you'll hear different different approaches and different interpretations of how we've got to where we've got to but I, I, I'm not going to go through that in huge amounts of detail I think suffice to say I would completely concur with joy that we are at a really important important point. The reason why we um, engage with this, as I said, is because we were hearing from people with mental health problems that they really wanted us to look at the issue of acute and crisis care. Now, um, you'll, you'll be very familiar that over the last few years in the context of the National Service Framework for Mental Health, there's been a lot of focus, rightly, on uh, assertive outreach, early intervention, um, crisis teams, uh, very significant focus being placed on um, a, a community-based treatment approach. And as a result of that, I think we felt, and, and what people were telling us, was that maybe there hadn't been enough attention being placed on what was happening in inpatient units, uh, in acute settings, um, and, uh, and, and that, in a way, was a driver for us uh, looking at this. Sorry, the slides are jumping around a bit, but I'll, I'll flip back where it's appropriate. So we created a, um, an inquiry which, ran, which we set up in 2011, ran for a very long period of time, um, uh, really listening to what people were telling us about their experiences of acute, acute and crisis care. And uh, we found some excellent examples, some really, truly excellent examples of people doing truly fabulous things. Um, but we also found and heard of examples um, of, uh, of where that care wasn't at its best. It wasn't at the best quality that people wanted, people wanted and expected. Um, and the issue of restraint was, an, was a recurring theme in that, uh, in that inquiry. It was something that came up from time, uh, from time to time. Um, and so we, um, we launched the crisis care campaign in 2012, early 2012, late 2011, having done this inquiry. And to be honest, um, we were getting uh, quite a lot of people were listening to us a little bit, but not very much. And I would really encourage you to read the full inquiry report, not least because Alison Cobb, who was one of the authors of it, is in the front row. Uh, but but and, and it was a lot of work. But also because I think it contains some really important broad conversations about about the the the, the wider context of acute and crisis care. And uh, one of the kind of policy outcomes of that work that is running very much in parallel to this work on restraint uh, and restrictive practices is the Crisis Care Concordat. 
And I'm not quite sure whether that's been discussed much so far in the conference. Um, so I just want to pause very briefly and mention this. So one of the points that was being made from the inquiry and by many others was the, the importance of joining up the approach to crisis care. What do you do when somebody is in a crisis? How do you create an effective 999 equivalent for crisis care? When we know that there's the involvement and engagement of many different agencies, the police, the ambulance service, um, uh, uh, the acute care, men mental health services, um, uh, amongst, amongst others, local authorities often involved, voluntary sector involved. So the Crisis Care Concordat has emerged from um, this idea that maybe we could create a blueprint for um, uh, crisis, good quality crisis care. It's been signed off by t over 20 organisations at a national level, all the major organisations published by the Department of Health. And the task is now to create uh, local crisis care concordats. And so I'd very much encourage you, if you are um, interested in this area, to ask your mental health trust or your, uh, your mental health community uh, what, what progress is being made around signing a crisis care concordat. And I mention that because, of course, um, uh, what happens inside a ward is quite often the product of what has happened outside a ward before anybody has ever arrived there in the first place. And so the, the quality of uh, access to, to, uh, to crisis care and the quality of the way in which that crisis care is delivered is, an in, is a very, very important part of this, uh, of this context, of, the, of this conversation. So um, please do uh, have a look at the Crisis Care Concordat. There's a website, crisiscareconcordat.org, I think, or .org.uk, um, uh, which will give you lots of information about how to create a local crisis care uh, concordat. The other significant thing about that concordat, which is relevant for, the, for this issue, is that we now operate in a different world. Um, it wasn't that long ago that when uh, that people like us would go and lobby a minister and we say, we think this is terrible, the minister would consult the civil servants, consult a few experts, come up with a pronouncement, say, this is what we're going to do, and then it would kind of happen. Ish. Um, it's not, the world has changed profoundly um, in, in this context. So we do have a National Crisis Care Concordat, but the National Crisis Care Concordat recognises that it's only going to work if there are local crisis care concordats. And this, uh, uh, the delivery, the decentralisation, the localisation of delivery is an incredibly important part of this journey um, uh, around, around restraint and, and restrictive practices as well. So as part of our crisis care campaign, we did look at the question of restraint. Um, and uh, from the report, you'll see, again, please do read the report um, uh, in depth. It's, it's well worth a read. We launched it just over a year ago. Um, and uh, we got a rather a lot of interest for it. I think partly uh, because uh, it, of the context that you've already heard about from Joyce. Joy, sorry, Joy. Um, uh, but, but also... Um, uh, I think because we had come up with some numbers, or rather more accurately, we'd asked trusts to come up with some numbers. And those numbers, which I think are possibly have, may well have caused a little bit of controversy, um, gave, painted this extraordinary picture. And of course, there's a lot of context and a lot of texture around it. But at any level, when you look at these figures, which are provided by trusts on a freedom of information request, um, they painted this extraordinary level of variation, this extraordinary kind of picture of the um, applications and usage of, uh, of restraint. Lots of trusts, equally, were not in a position to tell us what, the numbers, what their numbers were, which, in, 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 in my view, was almost as worrying as the overall level, as some of this variation uh, that we were seeing. Now, I think... Um, uh, you know, maybe people. I know we took some criticism for for doing that, but but I I think one of the important points that I've heard time and time again since we published this data is that inside trusts, um, uh, people are taking uh, this issue a lot more seriously. People are looking at the quality of recording nationally. There is a good uh, re real uh, care uh, being addressed to looking at the question of reporting and recording and recognising that there are different environments where different, different situations may apply, but that uh, reporting and recording 
is a really important part of being able to tell a proper story uh, about restraint. Um, and uh, the guidance contains some really good quality suggestions about, uh, the, co about the use of data, uh, not just about the use of raw data, but also about contextualising the data. Um, and we really welcome the importance that's, that's, attached, um, that's attached to that. However, when you do look at this information, it begs the question, why is it that in some settings restraint has, appears to be used very widely and not in others? And I, I'm not gonna, I don't have time to go into the depth of that conversation. I suspect that's a conversation you've been having over the, class, the course of the last uh, few days. So it sets a, a benchmark, a, a, a kind of point in time uh, from which I think we move, we move on. Um, and in addition to that, and again, this echoes a lot of what you've already heard from Joy, um, when, when you combine that data with listening to people's experiences, what we heard were people talking about their trauma, the traumatic experience of, of, of uh, restrictive practice. We heard about poor quality communication and post in, in communication and post-incident reviews. We heard particularly about issues of uh, people from black and minority ethnic um, uh, ethnic communities. But we also heard concerns about staff, because I'm absolutely convinced that most people don't go into mental health services to restrain anyone. Most people go and work in the mental health services to deliver good quality therapeutic care for people uh, who really need help and support. But we were hearing concerns from staff saying that they felt uncomfortable about it. So I had three, three quotes from people. Um, a carer who gave us evidence, um, uh, having observed uh, the, uh, the experience that, he, that uh, their partner had had um, uh, uh, in the context of restraint. Secondly, and I think, again, you've, you've heard this before, but I think a very important point about the, the impact of people uh, on people of uh, restraint, particularly when you have experience, had your own experience of physical, uh, of physical abuse. Um, thirdly, though, the, there were some real positive examples of um, uh, good communication, good explanation, uh, uh, good conversations happening, even though this is a very difficult, uh, difficult environment to operate in. Uh, we also found that there were some, some initiatives working, working differently in different approaches, um, and uh, that that's, that's a real, that's, I think that's a real positive that we've started to see uh, a, number of, a number of sites talking and looking at a variety of different approaches. Um, and I know there are a number of workshops and probably experts in the room who know a lot more about this than I do, so I won't, uh, I won't talk about those other than to say, um, I think, from my point of view personally, I think there are, there's a place for different kinds, of, different kinds of approaches in different kinds of settings. So we've got the guidance. You've heard all about, uh, you've heard all about that. Um, and I just want to pull out a couple of uh, key points from our, from our point of view. Um, services where restrictive in, all services where restrictive interventions may be used must have in place restrictive intervention reduction programs. And uh, wherever possible, people who use services, family carers, advocates, and other re relevant representatives should be engaged in all aspects of planning their care, including how to respond to crisis situations, post-incident debriefings, rigorous reporting arrangements for staff, and collation of data regarding the use of restrictive interventions. And I'm, I sit on the um, mental health uh, part of the patient safety board uh, set up by mental, uh, NHS England. And one of the conversations that this group, that group is currently having is about how do the principles of things like duty of candour apply into these kinds of environments. And the group, which is a very uh, cross-organisational group, is very clear that that duty of candour applies equally in uh, mental health inpatient settings as it should do in acute settings. So the learnings and responses from the Francis Review should apply equally inside mental health settings um, as, uh, as in the acute setting. And it's a big mistake that far too many people are making, that they, people believe that the Francis recommendations are only about acute hospitals. They're not. The Francis recommendations, as uh, uh, very clearly articulated by Robert Francis himself the other day, are uh, as much about uh, mental health settings um, as others. 
Um, I want to touch now on this question of co-production. So uh, guidance, again, suggests that policies must be co-produced with people who use services and carers. The policy should explain how people who use services, um, uh, their carers, families and advocates, participate in the planning, monitoring and reviewing the use of restrictive interventions and in determining the effectiveness of restrictive intervention reduction programmes. And this will include providing accessible updates and publishing key data within quality accounts. Now, um, I, I think in mental health, we can be really proud of the progress uh, that has been made around user and carer involvement and participation. I think, uh, having uh, looked across other bits of the NHS, that this is something that we do really, really well on the whole. We involve people in, uh, in a way that is much more progressive, I think, than lots of other parts of the NHS. Uh, you don't see a lot of patient participation in orthopaedic surgery, for example. Um, but you do see a lot increasing amounts of patient co-production and, and carer co-production in mental health settings. But I think this guidance is a really timely reminder that there is a really great opportunity to get this right uh, in terms of the co-production of, uh, of the programmes. And I know uh, you had a presentation, I think, yesterday from the Mersey Care team. I know that that uh, example uh, uh, has embedded user and care experience in the production of the work that has been done. And uh, I'm hugely impressed with the impact that that pilot has already had on use of restrictive practices in their environment. And I saw a presentation from them a couple of weeks ago you know, with some really impressive um, uh, outcomes. And I think a big part of that is, is because of these different factors. So there's this factor of leadership, and I think leadership is incredibly important in this, in this sphere. And one of the key, I think, positives in having this guidance, having some momentum, as Joy described it, the perfect storm, having some momentum around this perfect storm is that leaders' attentions are being put on it. Clinical leaders, uh, chief executives of trusts have to pay some attention to this. So this is the moment. If you've been working in this area for many years, and I know a lot of you have, and you really want to do something about it, this is the moment to do it. This is the time when the attention is on it. But I think also a key part of the success will be the involvement of frontline staff and uh, people who use the services. So that co-produced model in terms of, def in terms of creating and describing uh, what should be done in this environment, I think are the, the, the equation, are the active ingredients for, um, for delivery. And that includes the question of learning as well. Um, I think bringing people together, bringing people to share their lived experience, um, as well as uh, professional experience, is, an important, is a really important part, uh, part of this. Um, I think our, our kind of conclusions around this is that, as you've already heard, there wasn't enough voice of people who were at Winterbourne View um, we know that people can and will speak out. And we also know uh, that when you involve people with direct experience, uh, that can influence the practice inside, inside trust, inside settings. Um, and uh, I, I suppose I now want to just touch briefly on this question of therapeutic optimism. Because um, I, I think increasingly we have moved the, the kind of um, zeitgeist of um, mental health care, the rhetoric around mental health care is, is moving from a place that has, has spent quite a lot of time talking about safe services, quite rightly, um, and a lot of focus uh, around safety and uh, um, preventing, reducing the number of inpatient suicides, for example, which is an absolutely terrific uh, achievement in terms of the progress that's been made. But increasingly we are hearing now about recovery about therapeutic optimism, about supporting people in their journeys to recovery, um, and uh, that inpatient care plays an absolutely vital part in setting people off uh, on, in their journeys in the right way. And you know, I pay tribute to all those people who have worked incredibly hard to get this kind of, this kind of issue um, on, on the agenda. Um, and we increasingly are hearing that echoing around um, policy conversations around practice conversations. 
Um, and uh, and the, you know, in, that, in those contexts, we know that restraint shouldn't play a role. It should play the minimum possible role um, in, in that context. Um, and uh, you know, the work that, work that people like Len and people like Marion Janna in Star Wars have done to think, help us all to think about that positive therapeutic optimism, I think is really important. Finally, um, I, I, I suppose my, my kind of last thoughts on this would be how do we help, you know, what would success look like in four or five years' time in this agenda? We, we've made uh, a, a start, but we're operating in a really difficult and challenging environment. You know, we know that pressure on spend is huge. And when pressure on spend is huge, what tends to happen? Detentions go up. Um, uh, the, the risk is that uh, staffing is reduced because people want to slice off a little bit of a little bit of funding because they can't quite make the budget m make the budget work. So this th this issue is a really important part of that conversation about the best possible quality mental health care for all. In in five years' time, we we should be in a position to talk about being world leaders in this. I think actually we are a long way down the line when you look at some of the evidence that has already been collated. I think we can and should be world leaders in this question of restraint. We can show that uh, inpatient settings can uh, deli deliver an unrestricted, unrestrictive practice on a, on, a routine, uh, on a routine basis. On Monday, the mental... Disability Advocacy Centre, which you may have come across as a human rights organisation in uh, works across the world, is publishing a report that's talking about the state of psychiatry in the Czech Republic, where caged beds are still routinely used by, um, by people, by psychiatrists in, in uh, government funded uh, uh, settings. You know, we are doing some good stuff in this country and we should be really proud of what we're doing. But I also think that this is an example where we can show true excellence, both as a service, both as a way that uh, professionals work uh, in a co-production way with their patients, but also in terms of helping people's ambitions become reality. Um, and that surely is what we're all here to do. Thanks very much indeed.